Okay. Uh, thank you so much for having me, um, uh, for the Prague Time people and also for, uh, for Tarend. Um, yeah, I'm Lilith and I'm going to talk about no code uh, with you today. Who has heard about no code before? That's quite a lot. That's awesome. And who of you knows that he or she has worked with no code before? Because I'm sure you all do, but you might not call it that way. Okay, cool. So a little bit of experience here. All right. A um, little bit of background uh, about me. I'm Lilith. I'm the co-founder of uh, Visual Makers. And I actually don't have a technical background. So a few years ago, I wanted to be an actress and had no idea about even Excel. So I was really not technical at all. Um, and when I joined my, my first startup, kind of by accident, um, because I needed a job, over the summer as a working student. So that's how I kind of ended up in the startup world. Um, and fortunately stayed there um, and they worked with no-code automation tools. And at that time, I thought that every company would work with these no-code tools, right? Um, and suddenly, well, not suddenly, but eventually I, I figured out that um, this is not the case and uh, that more people should learn about, about no-code. Um, I specialize in uh, process automation um, and prototyping with uh, with no code, where the different areas of no code are, uh, we come we come to a bit later. Uh, but that a little bit about me, and about our company. Um, I'm really passionate about making tech more accessible. Um, so I really believe that by democratizing tech, um, by giving access to more people who are probably not not as technical as software engineers. Uh, we can build better products, find better solutions, um, if we kind of all work together and have a basic understanding of how software works. And that's why we founded uh, Visual Makers two and a half years ago, um, me and my, my co-founder Alex, which you see over here. Uh, we're now 10 people um, and we uh, do training. We are an agency for, for no and uh, low code. So we build software with no low code um, and have the biggest community in the DAH region. Um, right now, feel free to join. Uh, it's a Slack workspace uh, and makers kind of exchange there uh, about different tools, different approaches, um, and so on. So, why is no code so important? We have 87, which is surprisingly low number, I would say, even, um, can read, write, and, and count, but only uh, 0 0.3 percent of the world population can code and in a even more digitized world where we uh, rely heavily on software this is just not enough and there's a huge gap between business people and tech people i'm sure you experienced that yourself <laughs> before so and i probably don't have to show you this uh this graph um it's, i'm sorry it's german uh, i didn't find the <laughs> the graphics in english but um, yeah, we have a huge problem because our need for application is growing um, and we need more de developers than we can ever get if we just rely on, on code. So we think um, that kind of the fundamental challenge of every company right now is the ability to adapt to change because the world is changing more rapidly, right? But, but how good are we as a company or as companies to, um, to innovate, to be agile, to, to react to unknowns, right? And for that, or in part, no code, um, or let's say no code is part of the solution, or can be a big part of the solution. And before we come to the point like, what is no code anyway? Um, let's ju just say first that no code is nothing new. No code, like the term no code, <laughs> is kind of the, the sexy new way to talk about tools where you can drag and drop things around and don't have to, to rely on code if you don't want to. But the idea itself um, is not new, as uh, Steve Jobs already said, I think in the 90s. I'm not sure if it was late, late 80s or 90s. So no code is, in my opinion, it's not the right term. I really like the term because it's so easy, right? And uh, but no code doesn't actually mean no code, right? Because there's code behind it, right? But you don't have to ever interact with it if you don't want to. And that makes it so accessible 
and so easy to learn because the concepts of no code are the same as in code. Like when you build something with no code, um, for example, a simple marketplace or so, if you build a shitty database, then your marketplace will be pretty slow. So we have performance problems, but it would be the same if you would do it with code, right? So it's the same problem, a principle, um, it's just a visual interface on top of it. Probably pictures say more than a thousand words. <laughs> so that's, if you see it in comparison, the right side is so much more approachable than the left side because you can actually see, even as a non-technical person, what is happening there. You see that you connect different systems. On the right side, you see the, um, the screenshot of a cool a tool uh, called Make, uh, make.com. It's a really shitty name for SEO, but <laughs> you'll get used to it. Um, and they are an automation tool where you kind of connect different <coughs> systems with each other. You can think of it as little front ends for API endpoints that are really easy to, to access from any team member of any department. What I find really, really important when we talk about no code or tech in general, and probably you as product managers or product people know that better than, than anyone, is that no code, low code, code, whatever technology you wanna, uh, you wanna use is mean, our means to an end. They are not the end itself. Because we wanna build great products, right? We wanna build solutions for problems that we identified. Um, and sometimes no code is the best solution for that because we're faster, um, because it's more accessible to more team members, but sometimes code might be the better solution. And the power of no code kind of lies in the combination with low code and code, because it's not about one or the other, but it, it works really great in, in combination. What that means, uh, we come to later, but um, I can give you an example of one of our projects that we do right now. We're doing a, um, for one of the biggest private universities in, in Germany, we're doing a um, semester planner. How would, I'm not sure what the kind of planning the curriculum thing. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe it's the same word, yeah, <laughs> true. Um, and we're building only the front end. The whole back end with a huge algorithm is built with code by another agency. Um, and we're just building the front end with no code because it's so much faster. So why would we kind of combine the two? Um, and so the development itself kind of gets done, done faster. So um, you can really combine um, no code, low code and code and build it really modular. Um, so it's not the question of, should I use only no code um, or should I use only code, but use that what is best kind of for, uh, for the application or for the part of the application. Um, was someone, has someone seen a talk of, of me before anywhere? Okay, very good, you did. <laughs> okay, so probably I, I bring this slide to every talk I do, and it's, it's old, it's not even at all complete, but what I wanna show with that uh, slide or with that landscape is that we have kind of these obvious tools in obvious kind of categories, right? We have app builders, visual app builders. Um, we have website builders where you kind of drag and drop your, your website. Um, we have automation tools and we have visual database uh, tools. So kind of, we can think of it as front end, back end. Sometimes there are full stack tools and some of them are easier to use and some of them um, are more complex. But what is really cool about no code is that there are also tools um, that can just do one specific thing really good. By example, all these membership tools that you see over here, they are really good at authentication, um, user management, and, and so on. And you just connect it with APIs, integrate it in your tool, whether it's with code or with no code, doesn't really matter. But you can use tools who, to, to build things that are not the USP of your product. So you can focus with your dev team uh, on the things that really matter and where you really need, uh, where you really um, create value for your customers, right? Um, 
We could also kind of discuss what is a no-code tool anyway, because for me, coming from automation, everything that has an API is kind of a no-code tool, because I can connect it with these different tools, and also tools like a CRM, like HubSpot or Salesforce or so, let me kind of create processes that I use, kind of custom processes that I, I use in my, in my team. So that's also kind of some sort of no-code. So, but then basically you could also say every SaaS tool is kind of no-code. So the, you know, there are no, no strict lines. Um, whereas no-code or not, no-code kind of describes the, the tools where you can create custom software really easily um, in a kind of standardized way. So because there are, these are quite a lot of tools, um, I brought you the, the most important ones that, that I think are really worth uh, noticing. I'm probably going to be able to send the slides also, also afterwards. Um, not sure if I am, if I can do that, like sending the slides over. Perfect. Um, and so I brought you a little uh, um, few tools that are really worth looking at, like uh, Bubble, which is kind of one of the most powerful full stack tools that we have right now. Uh, Make for Automation, um, Airtable as a visual database, uh, Software as a web app builder that is kind of limited design-wise and, and function-wise, but it's possible to build like web apps within 10 minutes with uh, software. So that's a really cool tool. Xano as a scalable backend, we come later to that, is no code scalable or not. Um, Retool for internal dashboards and so on. Webflow, some of you might know, uh, as a website tool. Um, Glide is also an app builder where you can also build native apps um, that are downloadable in the, in the App Store and Google Play Store. Um, and Levity, uh, which is an, an, I, an, I, an I, AI tool, <laughs> um, where uh, you can kind of build your own machine learning uh, algorithm um, based on, on data that you, that you put in. So I brought you a few examples of companies um, who are using no code, um, because I find some of them really surprising. So of course, there are a lot of startups um, and smaller companies or scale-ups who use uh, no code a lot. But we also have, um, uh, also have companies like uh, Freenow with a huge onboarding process, which I automated with uh, Workado, which is also um, a integration uh, automation tool. Um, and they didn't automate the, hey, it's so good that you're here part, but the, hey, you need an account for HubSpot, for Slack, for Teams, for whatever, all that stuff that is kind of this copy and paste stuff that nobody wants to do. Um, then Chisholm Group, uh, by example, uses Ninox to manage the stakeholders, the stakeholder communication for the ISO certification level for different departments, so really custom. Um, but really easy to build with, uh, with a tool like Minox. Um, DHL is also quite, a, um, quite an interesting example. Um, they build an app with uh, AppGyver, which is now bought by SAP, um, where they, they created an app so uh, the drivers of their uh, vehicles um, could send Schadensmeldungen, um, damage reports. That's, that's the word I was searching for. Uh, so before it was all kind of on, on paper uh, and everything got lost and so on. And so they built just that for that and could, um, could collect the data uh, structurized. Then city of Rotterdam, uh, which I find also pretty cool because it's a city, right? It's a government that's always kind of slow. Um, build a lot of apps from COVID response apps to parking lot apps uh, and so on with, with no code tools. Um, Teleclinic is a startup from, from Berlin, which I find quite interesting because they have um, health data, so really sensitive data, and they managed to automate a lot of their processes without uh, violating uh, laws and so on. So that's really cool how they did it. Um, and Bayern Werknet also from the um, governmental um, sector. So um, yeah, um, these are quite some examples that I brought to you. I'm, uh, I have one example that I want, uh, want to dive a little bit deeper into. So before we go into the deeper example, like what are use cases 
for, for no code. So one of the obvious ones is process automation. So you have copy and paste tasks, you have rep rep repetitive tasks, or you have processes like um, going from one team to another, like from marketing um, to sales to customer success um, to marketing again or so, right? So you have all these processes that kind of go the same um, every time they, they are done and you can automate a lot of them. Um, so there, there are tools like Make or Zapier or Workado, um, but also a lot of these AI tools which can be integrated in all these processes. Then you have the whole topic of data synchronization. So how often have you tools where you have like one single source of truth, but you have like three other tools where this information should be as well. And for some reason, it's not. And until you find out like, okay, where, how can I put all, how can I synchronize all that data? Uh, no code is one answer to that. Um, so it's really easy to, to have data everywhere um, in the same time um, at the same information level. Um, same goes for internal tooling. Um, I'm sure a lot of you had the situation before where there was something to be built which, which was not customer facing and nobody had time for that because it was always deprioritized. So no code allows you to not bind that many resources um, and just either build it yourself or someone, I don't know, a working student or someone with no technical background can just build a really fast internal tooling which can help a lot in stakeholder management like visualizing data, uh, dashboards and so on, but also kind of um, internal processes um, where you have some kind of front end and then automate it again in the back end. Um, of course, the whole topic of prototyping, building speedboats um, with not that many resources because you want to test it out first, right? Uh, before you build a product or feature or so. So prototyping is a, is a big topic. Um, we come later to that also a little bit more in detail, um, but also customer facing apps. For example, we have a lot of clients who build um, customer portals with us. So they had um, their marketing process, their sales process, and then we built with them a customer portal where everything was handled from document management contract signing uh, and so on. And they just had a dashboard so the customers could always see kind of, okay, where are we uh, in this process? What does uh, the, the vendor need from me and so on? So we're super transparent. Um, there was a lot of back and forth before. It, was, it took a lot, a lot of time to onboard new clients and they just handled it with, with that internal app. So it can also be um, customer facing, but also whole product. So it doesn't have to be just a side product. Depending on what you're building and what the product is, um, it can also be um, used as normal software development. And for data visualization, I already said a little bit. Um, but when we talk about product, um, use cases for product uh, with no code especially, do you have any ideas like apart from the prototyping and process automation uh, part? Do you have any ideas why else no code might be interesting for, for product teams? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, a B test, but also if you're not sure if a new product branch is kind of the right thing to, to build, then you can just build it real quick in like two to three weeks, uh, depending on how, how big it is. And, um, and then you just test it out with clients and then you can iterate really fast. So that's, that's what I meant with, uh, with testing. And um, that's also one of the one of the things that I find most important, especially for product teams, um, that you're just you can build speedboats that are real speedboats and not okay, we have one and a half years to build that speedboat, right? So um, to test 
um, product ideas, features, uh, to see like, okay, what do you, uh, really data-driven um, experimenting. Um, because in the environment we have right now, as companies, we need to be innovative, but the cost of innovative, like the risk of in innovation needs to be really low, right? And because no code is so fast, it's really cost effective. Um, and that's why innovation can, can be done at a really high level, a fast pace, um, but also really cost effective. Um, next to the, the prototyping, the integration and, and the time to market, um, aspect. What, one aspect I find really important is also the empowerment of non-technical people. So I know a lot of product managers who have no technical background but want to learn how to code. Um, you don't really have to learn to code. Of course, I would encourage everyone to learn to code, but with no code, you can understand like how databases work. How does an API work? How do you go back and forth and the communication really gets a lot better with technical teams. If everybody is on board, even on the simple tools, you have a basic understanding and that drives a lot of um, the companies we work with who started with no code. Um, you could see that, that, that there was a mindset shift. Um, people were kind of, they were questioning processes. They were questioning um, how are we going to build this? Like, is that really the, the best way? What, what if we do that or try that? And the communication got a lot better. The, the thinking about the problems got a lot better. Um, so it, it really drives a mindset shift into an kind of an innovation, exploration, um, and scientific uh, mindset. So that's also a big part. Then another part, a little bit more on the prototyping side, is has anybody of you had that this problem before that you had kind of the gap between okay you have a figma prototype with click dummy and then you decide to build it and then along the way after two years you find out like ah there was a lot <laughs> that went wrong and no code kind of gives you a way to fill that gap in between so you can build a prototype, like a high fidelity prototype, which is not a click dummy, um, to test real processes, like how do your customers interact with your product. And not only is the flow of clicks right, but also how high um, is the, um, the, what are they willing to pay? How do you, um, you, you can test like everything <laughs> in no code at a much faster time um, until you, you would build. And you don't have to rebuild the whole thing once you tested it, you iterated it, and then um, and then you have to you don't have to throw the whole no code thing away um, and build then the whole thing with code. Um, but you can build really, really modular. And one example I brought you today um, is by a company called Finn. Um, does anybody know Finn? craft subscription company. So they kind of do uh, e-commerce for automotives. So uh, what you do is you go on a website, you order a car, and then it is brought to you uh, and on your doorstep. And the only thing you have to do is to, um, is to uh, go to the gas station and fuel it. So everything else, like from licensing, um, the um, insurance, and so on, everything else is handled by Finn. So there's a lot of operations uh, behind this. So they were founded in 2019. They're now, that's probably an old number, there are more uh, than 400 employees now. Um, they're also also based in the, they're based in Munich, but also expanded to the, to the US. Um, and they started in 2019. They started with Webflow uh, as their website. Zapier as their automation tool and Google Sheets as their database. Never used Google Sheets as a database, but they did. <laughs> it's a spreadsheet, not a database. Um, so that's how they started. Really lean, they had a prototype set up in a week. Um, and so they started with that. They could already um, get subscriptions and handle customers because every a lot of what was happening behind the scenes was manually, but they kind of learned on the go and could automate um, all the things 
with a Zapier. So they iterated a lot. So every time they, they came to a point where a tool was not enough anymore, like they exchanged Google Sheet for Airtable and then later to Retool and so on. So every time they were really fast at iterating in these tools kind of, and they had, um, well, in, in uh, 2021, two years later, um, it was all a serverless microservice infrastructure, all in-house developed. They were, they were, I think there are five founders and all of them or four of them or so are engineers, but they started with Melcode anyway, because they said it's so much faster. We have to learn so many things about how does it work to do e-commerce in, in, the, in the car industry, right? So they said it doesn't really make sense to build it all in code because we don't know enough about it. Um, because we have to change so fast and so many things that it makes much more sense um, to, to build it with now code. And I love that, that thought because you can apply it like to every product decision, or not every product decision, but to a lot of product decisions um, kind of we do uh, when, we, when we work uh, in our companies. So they had more than uh, 200 serv uh, services um, uh, integrated um, in their whole structure uh, of, their, of their product. And um, but let me tell you that a thousand automated scenarios across seven teams is a lot. Um, they are now, I just was in, in Munich at a make conference where, where I talked with them. They're now at 180 million um, uh, for, for a year. So uh, it's got even bigger. So then last year, um, they published an article that said no code isn't scalable. And when you read it, then it kind of, you, you read it kind of as a love letter to no code. So, but they, they kind of moved their core product, um, like their database, they moved that to, to custom code. Why did they do that? So the more visual you have an interface, the more um, server um, capacities you need, right? So, um, you have, at some point, it really depends on which tool you use, but at some point you have the issue of speed and av availability of the database. So, for example, Airtable is a visual database. It, had, it, had li it has limits, like how many records you can store, which is really bad for any database. Um, but also it, had, it has uh, limits in, um, in the API requests. So you can only do like five or so per second. And that's not enough if you have, I don't know, 6,000 customers um, uh, ordering in the same order process, right? Um, they also had problems with, because they were limited in the databases, they only, they, they kind of connected different databases with each other. So it was not really clear, okay, where's the single sort of, of uh, truth now? Um, and also who has access to, to what. So the ownership and access management kind of got out, out of control. Um, and also where, you know, every one of you probably has deleted by accident a cell a formula in Excel, right? <laughs> so that can happen, uh, not as fast, but it can happen in Nokia too, right? In visual databases when everybody has access. Um, then there were performance issues, like when you build really fast and you maybe not build for scalability, um, at the beginning, so um, performance can be an issue, uh, synchronization, I already said that. And what is not really true, but what I get asked a lot is about vendor login. When you build on a platform that you never kind of get out of that platform. That's not, it really depends on the tool, but in, in often it's not the case because um, it's all uh, modular um, and accessible via uh, APIs. And in a lot of cases, you can also download the code of course, it's then in the framework of the, of the, um, of the tool uh, if you download the code, but it's, it's still really, really flexible to work with. So I would say vendor login is kind of in, in brackets. So what did they do and why are they still in love with no code if it didn't work out, right? Um, so they developed their core product, like their database with custom code. But as they grew, there were a company of, of great transparency because everybody was access to uh, was able to access um, the database right they could just open it and see it visually they didn't have to search for it right 
So um, it was really important to them to give their employees and their departments access to that level of information, but without all the limits and so on they had before. So what they did is they built their own applications within the automation tools. So you see that little, uh, little app here. That's their own custom app. So they have their custom code um, database. And then on top of that, they use Make as an automation tool. And these bubbles are kind of modules in, in Make. And they build their own modules for their own custom code products so that the employees can access the data anyway and work with it. And um, I don't have a screenshot of how the, the kind of input looks like, but you can think of it as a little form. It opens up, it, there's a form where it says like, here's the connection, connect your account, um, tell me which data I should map to which field in the next module, right? Um, so it's really easy to access and you have um, a lot of control of what can be accessed, what type of data can be input to the, um, can you put in, in the database, um, and also what can get out. Um, and also on a really great level of, of uh, user access management um, and team management and so on. So that is one great way kind of to connect code and no code um, on a level that you still have that, that playing field of everybody has access. So if Finn thinks about like, oh, we shouldn't have built on no code, they're absolute fans of no code. Um, because what it did for them was they were extremely fast from uh, 2019 to 2022, 20, uh, they grew to 400 employees and um, went to the US uh, and expanded, right? And they, I'm not sure how many million uh, subscription they have now, I think it's like 20, uh, 20 million or so. No, 20,000 probably. No, forget that number, I'm not sure about it. <laughs> um, they had a simplified recruiting uh, process because they were looking for, they were still looking, of course, for a lot of uh, deaths, right? Um, but they were also looking for so-called BAMs. They had, uh, they are business automation managers. Um, so they're kind of in between product and dev, but they never have a uh, technical background. So. Uh, but it made, the, made it really easy uh, for, for them to, to hire fast. Um, the whole topic of transparency, like everybody kind of has a basic knowledge of how their software works and can put their, their minds on it. Um, they're really efficient because everybody um, in their company knows how to no code, kind of. So they all have a basic course of uh, no code automation. They're really data driven because data is visual. Uh, kind of, it kind of comes to, uh, along when you automate it. Uh, then you want to have it visual because it's so easy. Um, and they have automation as their DNA. Um, so as I said before, kind of this mind shift thing where you always kind of ask like, how can we do this better? And when do we automate uh, things? All right. Then maybe to the question, like when should I use no code? Um, and when not. I wouldn't say that there's like one answer to that, but I kind of try to give you a rule of thumb here. Um, so the less complex things are, the more you should think about doing it with no code. The more complex, it might make more sense to do it with code. Um, like the example of the, of the data heavy algorithm that I had before with the university, I wouldn't recommend to build that um, same with the higher the volume of your data is, um, the lesser it's, it's probably um, like a no code only scales in up to a certain amount of data. Um, so they're all getting better. So they're kind of enterprise ready tools now where you have um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of the tools are scalable, um, but then often they're more in the low code department. So we always have to look like, okay, how, how many data um, is my tool going to, to work with? Um, on the other side, the more integrations you have and the more APIs you kind of have to, to connect, then it might make more sense to use tools like Make to connect uh, these different systems. 
And also uh, when it comes to speed, like how fast does it need to be done? And the faster it needs to be done, um, the better it is, is to build with, uh, with no code. So coming almost to an end, <laughs> I'm of course a little biased uh, when it comes to no code and where I see the kind of why it's cool uh, and why you should be uh, kind of, um, yeah, uh, a little, a little um, conscious with it. Um, is so I think the, the most important thing is the incredible speed with what you can build. Um, happy to, uh, if you want to check it out, we have a no code fundamentals course where you kind of learn in, in a few hours to build your first app, your first automation and so on. You find it on our website. Then you kind of get a feeling of how fast you can build. Um, extreme flexibility, uh, because you can build so fast, uh, you can iterate really, really fast and really um, develop really close to the, to the market. Um, you can create focus for your dev teams because they can really focus on the USP or creating value um, that only you can do um, in, in your teams uh, for the product. Um, and yeah, like I said, um, what where you should watch out uh, for no code is the database limits, vendor logins um, from tool to tool, um, API write uh, limits, and, and sometimes database limits. Um, not all of them have them. Um, but yeah. If you want to know more about, um, about no code, about Finn, especially also, uh, we have a podcast. Um, feel free to, to listen. We have, uh, we're almost at 100 now, uh, almost at 100 episodes. Um, and we interview founders who work with uh, no code um, or companies who work with no code um, and also um, founders of, of tools um, that, uh, that create no code tools and talk with them kind of on no code development and so on. Um, yeah, and just, uh, just again to, to remind you, if you wanna learn uh, how to, to no code, we have a lot of free courses um, on, on our website. We also have master classes um, where you kind of deep dive and become an expert in those no code tools. Um, we also do boot camps on rapid prototyping and so on with no code. Um, we also do development um, and feel free to join our community where you kind of can exchange with other no coders. Uh, and no-code makers. Um, and last but not least, I'd be happy to connect. Um, if we are not already uh, on, on LinkedIn, I'm happy to answer all, all your questions also here. Um, so yeah, thank you so much.